Good day, everybody. Welcome to the Bible in a Year 2021. We are on day 184 of 2 Kings chapters 5 through to 8. And as I said before, there's a, a lot of detail as we go through a lot of kings, and we're dealing with Elijah and Elisha in these in these chapters. So mainly Elisha now, because Elijah's gone. Um, and uh, we can't we can't touch on everything. It's just impossible. I, I can't go into every detail unless you want like two or three hours of this, which I don't think you want to. Uh, and again, we're just trying to highlight things that have to do with uh, relationship um, from the heart of Yahweh. And we find here in 2 Kings 5, uh, we, we know uh, what's going on here. There's uh, Naaman has a skin disease and um, he's, he's uh, been told about Elisha and he goes to his own king um, and uh, he's looking for help. And, and there's assumption here. Uh, I, I think there's some things that we don't always pick up on because we're in such a hurry to read through. But if we understand relationship, if, if Elisha, the prophet, is so mighty, uh, his reputation is, is everywhere. Uh, he has impact in every nation. But he's housed in, in Israel, in the kingdom of Israel. So you would think that the king of Israel would look upon this guy as a treasure. And, and, and that's what we, I think we find here with the, uh, with Aram's king, is that he's thinking that the king of Israel is well aware of Elisha. He's considered a treasure. Uh, he's kind of like a secret weapon he's keeping to himself. And, and so that's, that's what he does for his top guy, Naaman, here. Uh, then Aram's king said, go ahead, I will send a letter to Israel's king. And, and by sending a letter to Israel's king, by saying, I'm sending Naaman to you to be healed, he's assuming that the king of Israel would know automatically he's talking about Elisha. So, so Naaman left. He took along 10 kickers of, uh, of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. He brought the letter to Israel's king. It read, along with this disease, I'm sending my servant Naaman so you can cure him of this skin disease. <laughs> you can imagine how the king freaked out, and he did. He, he freaked out, and he, he just figured, okay, he's just setting me up to, to have a war. Like, well, I, I'm not God. I, how can I heal this guy? Um, but then Elisha contacts him, and I want you to understand the sarcasm that, that could be here. Okay, I am seeing it as sarcasm. Um, so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that Israel king had ripped his clothes, that's what you do when you're at your wit's end and, and, and uh, you're, you're just, you're laying yourself before God. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, so he ripped his clothes. He sent word to the king. Why did you rip your clothes? Let the man come to me. <laughs> then he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. See, there's, there's I, I don't know if you can read that or not. Um, not everybody uh, picks up on, on what could potentially be sarcasm. Um, but that's how it comes across. And then, then he'll know. Then he'll know. He went to you and he knows nothing. Send him to me and then he'll know that there's a, a prophet in his room. And then we have a lesson on failed expectation. Uh, quite often we, we, we come before the Lord and we have this expectation on how things are going to be answered. And that's quite often how we missed uh, answered prayer. That's how, that's how we, we miss the Lord responding to our prayer. Because... We've set up this expectation. We have it in our mind how this is going to play out. And uh, it doesn't always work that way uh, with the Lord. Uh, seldom does. And, and so we have that with Naaman. You know, and, and the prophet uh, has sent word to Naaman, or gave him instruction on what to do. Uh, but, and this is what we read in verse 11 and 15 of, of chapter 5. Uh, but Naaman went away in anger. He said, I thought for sure that he'd come out. Stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hands over the bald spot, and cure the skin disease. Aren't the rivers in Damascus, the Abana, and uh, Farfar, Farpar, better than all Israel's waters? Couldn't I wash in them and get clean? So he turned away and proceeded to leave in anger. This is this is a failure where we we often think that the instruction we receive is about that object that thing. It's not about the river. It's about his obedience. 
It's not about dipping in it seven times. It's about his obedience in dipping it seven times. That it, there's a humbleness that 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 comes in, um, and we've looked at it before. Sometimes uh, God just overrides all of that by His grace, but other times He He needs us to step into a place of humility to receive what He wants us to receive, and that's what this is about. And, and Naaman uh, was about to miss out on it, but then a servant. He's got many servants, but here's one servant who steps forward. He's who he steps up to the to the, to the boss. Neiman's servants uh, came up to him and, and spoke to him. You know, our father is the prophet. Um, oh, sorry, our father. If the prophet had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All he said to you was wash and become clean. So Naaman went down and bathed in the Jordan seven times, just, just as the man of God had said. He stepped into obedience in a position of humility. His skin was restored like that of a young boy, and he became clean. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, we see here, let's just read this. He, in, in verses 15, 16, he returned to the man of God with all of his attendants. He came and stood before Elisha saying, now I know for certain that there's no God anywhere on earth except in Israel. So there you have belief. He's got, he's, he believes. And quite often um, for a lot of people, they can come to a point of belief through a miracle. It doesn't mean that they're going to stay in their place of belief because it can wear off if you don't pursue a relationship. Uh, but at least he's here and he's acknowledging um, Yahweh. And then, and then his heart's filled with gratitude. He's got to do something. He, he, wants to, he wants to give something because he received something. And he says, please accept a gift from your servant. But, but uh, Elijah, Elisha here uh, has to make a point. Um, and, and the, these miracles are not to be, not to be bought. And, and it's not that Naaman was trying to, to buy it. Uh, it was a thing of gratitude, but even when it's given in the right heart, sometimes these things are refused because others could be looking in and not understand and, and misunderstand it. Um, and so Elisha said, I swear by the life of the Lord, I serve that I won't accept anything. He won't take anything. Um, he's, he's not for sale. He's not for sale. He, even though he has received gifts from other people and distributed them because his provision is from the Lord. He's distributed those to the, in, to the school of prophets. Uh, but in this case, he's not going to accept anything. So Naaman urged Elisha to accept something, but he still refused. Okay, so he goes off. Um, and then we have uh, Elisha's at, at, um, assistant here, his, his number one assistant, um, Gehazi, um, we have him ruining the testimony. So he thought, my master let this Aramean Naaman off the hook by not accepting the gift he brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I'll go after him and accept something from him. And he just, he ruins the testimony. Uh, he, he ruins the whole point here that uh, Elisha is making. So uh, Elisha calls him out on it, tells him exactly. He says, listen, I was there when, when the man got off the horse. I was there. I heard you say this. I, I, you know, the Lord has let me see these things. So Elisha said to him, wasn't my heart going along with you when the man got off his chariot to meet you? Is this the time to accept silver clothes? olive trees, vineyards, sheep, cattle, or male and female servants, because he's, he's in the middle of this. He, he is testifying to the Lord. He, this is a witness. This is a testimony. The Lord is providing for him. Nobody, he's not in anybody's pocket. This isn't a time of gifts. This isn't a time of, of, of prospering in that way. Um, this is, this is a time of establishing the Lord because there's, there's going to be a difference between the first and second generation compared to the third generation, um, in, in Israel. And a lot of it has to do with Elisha, what Elisha is establishing and he can't let this, you know, charging fees or accepting these gifts, ruining that kind of thing. So the result is, he says, Naaman's skin disease will now cling to you and to your descendants forever. 
and Gehazi left Elisha's presence, flaky like snow with skin disease. We're going to see him come back in later uh, when he's testifying to, to the king of Israel concerning um, uh, the widow and the, and the, um, the resurrection of the, the, the dead child. Um, but really, he has nothing to do with Elisha going forward. Um, and then we have this wonderful tale um, here of, a, you know, uh, the timeline can be all over the place. So, you know, when you see um, uh, the, the servant back in there again, don't, don't get confused with it. But we have this thing here with, uh, with Aram's king again, uh, and Elisha's frustrating his, his plans. Here in verse uh, 11 to 13, Aram's king was extremely upset about this because Elisha kept uh, telling uh, Israel's king what's about to happen and frustrating Aram's um, uh, plans here. Um, he called his officers and said to them, tell me who among us is siding with Israel's king? One, is, one of his officers said, no one, your majesty. It's Elisha, the Israelite prophet who tells Israel's king the words that you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. He said, go and find out where he is. Then I will send men to capture him. They told him he is in Dothan. They know exactly where he is, but nobody's going after him. And, and how silly of this king when, when uh, Elisha is, is able to, <laughs> but if he knows, if he can hear these conversations, is he not hearing this conversation too? They, they, mm -hmm. But sometimes in frustration and anger, uh, we're not very logical. So, um, so the servant wakes up, looks, gets up on the roof. I guess they're sleeping on the roof. It must have been very hot. Looks around. He sees this massive army that is surrounding the town. And, and he goes to Elisha. And this is just an amazing thing. And a lot of us would like uh, to have eyes like this. But you know what? We, we, we've got to see with our imagination according to the promises that have been given to us. Not imaginary, imagination. We can see the unseen because we've been equipped with the imagination to see it. It's enough for, for us to know that this is the case, that this is the truth, that this is real. Uh, and, then, and then throughout our day, we should be able to see in our imagination the Lord all around us. And... Um, and so we see this, and, and don't be afraid, Elisha said, because there are more of us than there are of them. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he saw that the mountain was full of horses and fiery chariots surrounding Elisha. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, and, th and then this is how you deal with an enemy. I mean, we're, sometimes we just we just take on fights and we don't need to fight. Just learn how to pray properly. In verses 18 and 19, the Arameans came toward him. So Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this nation with blindness. Now, uh, I don't believe it's a, a literal blindness. I think it's a, a blindness of, of knowledge, of, of perception, understanding, uh, discernment. Um, that they just would not recognize um, Elisha or um, anything else for that matter. That There'd just be confusion there. Um, the Lord struck them blind, just as Elisha said. Elisha said to them, this isn't the right road or the right city. Follow me and I'll lead you to the man you were looking for. But he took them to Samaria. So there was a blindness there that they did not recognize Elisha or they couldn't discern it was him. And uh, they had no idea uh, that they were heading towards Samaria. Um, and, and then uh, once they get to Samaria, their eyes were opened and they realized where they were. And, and then the king comes uh, with a question. You know, this isn't his victory. This has nothing to do with this king. So he comes and he says, do I kill them? Man, they're not, the, they're not his prisoners. <laughs> As Elisha said, no, don't kill them. Did you capture them with your own sword or bow? Do you have the right to kill them? You're not your prize, but put food and water in front of them so they can eat and drink and return to their master. So the king gave them a great feast and they ate and drank. Then the king let them go and they returned to their master. After that, Aramean raiding parties didn't come into Israel anymore. <laughs> they, they dare not. <laughs> they dare not push their luck whatsoever. Um, and then just... 
just so that we can see uh, again the accuracy of of uh, Elisha's relationship with the Lord and, and how he heard um, from the Lord and, and understood these things. Uh, there's a, a siege going on. Um, uh, you know, it's really bad. Uh, people are eating their children. Um, it's just a, a disgusting thing. And, and we see here in chapter 7, verses 1 to 2, uh, uh, Elisha's uh, prophecy of the end. Um, and, and he says, hear the Lord's word. This is what the Lord says. At this time tomorrow, uh, a, a say of wheat flour will sell for a shekel at Samaria's gate. And two says of flour or barley will sell for a shekel. Now, I mean, there's no food. This, this does not make any sense. You can only imagine uh, if anybody has any food um, that there's no amount of money uh, that could be um, placed on that. You know, that's life and death there. So then the officer, the one the king leaned on for support, spoke to the man of God. Come on, even if the Lord should make windows in the sky. How could that happen? Man, think it. Don't speak it out because they have seen so many things happening, so many things that has happened as, as Elisha has spoken to them and revealed things to them. And they've seen these things. This guy should have just kept his mouth shut, even if it was what he was, what he was thinking. Elisha said, you will see it with your own eyes, but you won't eat from it. Yeah, that's bad news. And then we have, um, you know, when things look really bad, you, know, you just need the Lord on your side. Because this is what happens. The siege, it looks really bad. The Lord intervenes. But there, there was no one there. They heard the sound is what's happening, okay? So this massive army is there. They hear the sound. Fear, and this is what the Lord does. He touched them with fear, and their imagination took over. Um, but there was no one there because the Lord had made the Aramean camp hear the sound of chariots, horses, and a strong army. They had said to each other, listen, Israel's king has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to come against us. So they had got up and fled in the evening, leaving their tents, horses, and donkeys. They left the camp exactly as it was and ran for their lives. And then we have the fulfillment of the prophecy then in verses 16 to 17. Then the people went out and looted the Aramean camp. And so it happened that a, a say of wheat flour uh, did sell for a shekel and two says of barley sold for a shekel in agreement with the Lord's word. But the king had put the officer whom he leaned on for support in charge of the city gate. The people trampled the officer at the gate and he died. This was just what the man of God said when the king had come down to him. Sad, but there you have it. And, and we see evidence here that uh, Elisha, uh, although he's stationed in Israel, and, and this is the way it was with most of the prophets, is that they weren't just a prophet to Israel, but they were the Lord's prophet to wherever he sent them. And the Lord communicated with all the nations, as he did with the seven nations that Israel uh, came in to displace. Uh, for, for over 400 years, he, he, I, I'm sure he sent uh, prophets in to warn them of their ways. And, and it's based on the fact that these prophets also went into these other, uh, other nations. So in, in verse 7 now of chapter 8, now Elisha had gone to Damascus, where Aram's king, Ben-Hadad, became sick. Ben-Hadad you know, had done all kinds of bad stuff against Israel and Judah. So um, he became sick. The king was told, the man of God has come all this way. So Elisha was sent, but it's not going to be good. And, and some prophecies are harder to give than others. And we see that here in verses 10 to 12. Elisha said to him, you're talking to the servant, uh, go and tell him. You will definitely recover. But actually, the Lord has shown me that he will die. But it, it's, not, it's not of natural causes. It's not of illness. It's not of accidents. Elisha stared straight at Hazel until he felt uneasy. Then the man of God began to cry. Hazel said, Master, why, why are you crying? He's very confused. Remember, he's just a servant. 
And he says, because I know what violence you will do to the Israelites, Elisha said. You will drive them from their forts with fire. You will kill their young men with a sword. You will smash their children and rip open their pregnant women. And like Hazel just being a servant says, huh? How, how is that going to, how, why, how could I possibly do that? And, uh, and, and we discover, this is what I was talking about earlier. Um, we, we can question whether um, prophecy that comes in is, is telling us what, what's going to happen. Or is it the catalyst? Is it the thing that releases what's going to happen? Because Hazal turns around having received this prophecy and he actually kills uh, Ben-Hadad. Um, you know, he, he's sick and weak and he just puts a, a wet towel over his head so he suffocates. So there you go. That's, uh, that's a bunch of information there for you. So um, yeah, we're all supposed to be able to hear from the Lord. And uh, Maybe we can spend some time at another time just talking about how we tune ourselves to the Lord's voice so that we can hear too. You guys be blessed, be encouraged, have a great day, and um, we'll see you soon.